thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, here in New York, watching my show in person, and all of you watching this across the country tonight. Let me see how this looks here. You know, the microphone clip is on the wrong side tonight. Now, please, don't all rush out here at once. No, it's okay. Come on. But a little thing like that, you know, I'll start reading backwards out here. Uh, first up tonight, we have a 10-year-old uh, young man who has appeared now in a number of motion pictures, who received a nomination for an Academy Award for The Champ a number of years ago. Mr. Ricky Schroeder is here tonight. Uh, second, we have Mr. Iggy Pop, a young man who used to, uh, now get a load of this, he used to claw himself so severely during his rock performances that his skin would begin to bleed on stage. And I heard, ha, uh, see, <laughs> we know why they're here tonight, don't we? And uh, one time, uh, I'm told that he actually threw up on the audience. So the people in the first three rows here tonight, bad, bad trouble, okay? Uh, Jerome Smith is here tonight. He is the publisher of an economic newsletter and the author of a book which is called The Coming Cur Currency Collapse. So if you kind of thought that everything was going just fine in your life up until this point, we have some bad news for you tonight. We'll give you a little depressing news on the economy, but he will tell us how to handle the coming currency collapse. And Dorothy Greenpepper is back tonight, just in time for Valentine's Day, to read some hate poems to her ex-lovers. That is from uh, New York. Ricky Schroeder, the child motion picture actor, was once described by somebody as being 10 years old, going on 45. He began making television commercials when he was all of three months old, and since then he has skyrocketed to fame, starring in a motion picture called The Champ with John Voight. He's also been in The Last Flight of Noah's Ark, Little Lord Fauntleroy for television, and he now is appearing in the film called The Earthling with a co-star named William Holden. He is here tonight to tell us about his latest film and to share his thoughts on life as a 10-year-old movie star. Would you please welcome Mr. Ricky Schroeder. Ricky? <laughs> How come you know how to do that? Well, there's that guy I keep on saying, Ricky, don't forget to put on your mic. <laughs> <laughs> like, Ricky, don't forget to take your vitamins. Uh -huh. I don't want to do this. So let me give you a hand with that, Chan. Uh, like that? No. Yeah, yeah, that'll All fly. Right. That'll fly. Sure, that'll fly. <laughs> So, hi. Hi. <laughs> I said this line, 10 years old going on 45. Do you ever feel like that now that you've been nah. looking at pictures? No. I feel the same as any 10-year-old. I feel as active as any 10-year-old, anything like that. How can you feel the same, though, being a movie star? I'm not a movie star. I'm just myself. Really? Yes. Is it ever hard just to be uh, Ricky Schroeder? Um, no, not really. Tell me the truth now. I mean, maybe once in a while somebody says, like, Ricky, put on your microphone. Ricky, take your vitamins. Ricky, do this. Would Ricky ever say, hey, wait a second, Ma. Wait a second, Dad. No, you got to always listen to your parents. You know, the parents know best. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> you notice only the parents are clapping? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Ricky's not saying it like he believes it 100%, no. okay? What about your sister Dawn, the one who does the commercials and does the modeling? Oh, oh. she's um, she's okay. fourteen. She's fourteen. Yeah. She's like, gonna, no, she's going to be fourteen April third. I'm not checking tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you and she have a competition as to you know who can be in the most films or who oh, can no. get their picture in Nothing the paper like the most or something like that? No, we're we're great. Right? We're um we're, we're so close together. Mm -hmm. No um we don't do anything like that together. We're all just regular brother and sister. We fight sometimes, things like that. What is this? Want one? a candy? No, yeah. thank you. All right. Get one. All right. Would you like to have one? No. Oh, it's all okay. Right. What kind is it? Starburst. So oh, yeah. Well, here, I'll, I'll talk to right. you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Here. What else you got? <laughs> I got money. Okay. Uh, speaking of money, do you, uh, do you get an allowance or uh, do you get a salary? How does that work? Because you make a certain amount of money from the motion picture. Well, then that goes in the bank, you see. That mm -hmm. I, if I really want a toy, that's, it seems pretty good. It's not just one of those junky ones, then you know, the plastic type. Then um, I can get it. You know, if it's going to last for a while, then I can get it. But I can't get those cheap ones that are going to break in, in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. When you appeared in this most recent motion picture, The Earthling with William Holden, how was it different for you from making the one with John Voight, the champ? What were the differences in those two movies for you? Oh, well, um, in the Earth thing, I was, have you seen it? No. Oh, well, I was. I tried to see it, but the line was so long that I couldn't, I couldn't wait for it. <laughs> oh, well, I was just so, I just, the difference is the Earth thing was probably harder, you know, because I had to put myself in that outfit and 
I picture myself when my parents died. You know, it's bad enough letting John Voight die, which is my father. But then when two parents die and I'm stranded and I have nothing and I don't eat for weeks, it's, it's pretty tough. How do you put yourself in that frame of mind? Imagine that your mom and dad are gone and you're lost. Well, I just picture it, you know, I just imagine. I have a good imagination. But, like, did you say the lines differently in the champ as compared to the way you played your part in the earthling? I'm just wondering, you know, if you were able to perceive a difference in the role and how you get yourself psyched or put yourself in the frame of mind um, to be the different characters that you have No, to not be. really. I did the same type of thing. Like, um, I just, they were basically the same, you know, because the end I cried, the same I cried, and things like that. But um, I, I put myself in the state, same state of shock. You know? Mm -hmm. Could, can you cry whenever you want to? Yeah, you know. Um, I'm going to, you know, everybody's always thinking of something bad to make them cry. I'm going to get a new technique. So at this time, I think of something good that makes me cry. You know? I, um, I just think of something good, and it makes me cry. Like, were you ever so happy that you just cried? You know? Ha have you ever been? Yeah? Okay. I was. So I can use both ways. See? Well, like, what would you think of that's so good that makes you so happy that you'd start to cry? Um, Let's see if we can, Well, you know, when my cousin was born. People here have a couple of questions for you that sure. maybe I haven't thought of, okay? So okay. Uh, where are we lined up here? This gentleman right here. Yes, yeah. sir. How you doing, Rick? Hi. I'd like to know what it was like working with William Holden. I heard at one point he even wanted to adopt you. Oh, yeah, he said that, um, Ricky, can I adopt you and be your grandfather? And that's a, he's a real sweet guy. No, um... He's, he's the, directly the opposite of what he plays in the movie. <coughs> you know, we were such great friends. Um, he actually said, Ricky, you know, we're only kidding. You know, we're real great friends because he had to be mean to me in the film. Did you learn anything from him? Oh, we always, um, we'd always talk things over. Mm -hmm. And um, we, um, we just talked things over in the caravan and see what we're going to do. What would have happened? Have you ever thought what would have happened if you hadn't gotten the role in The Champ? Well, I guess I wouldn't have been here right now. Well, yeah. <laughs> but looking back on that possibility, would that have been a bad thing? Um, no, because when I when I don't get commercials, I just say, I'll try next time. You know? So you would have kept trying and trying and trying. I would have kept trying. on trying. Uh, uh, I was just lucky. Do you still want to be an architect? No. Nah, I like this. It's fun. Oh, you like this? Yeah. Huh? Have you read the lives or studied the lives of other kids who were stars and got no. A, no like uh, Jackie Cooper or Mickey um, no Rudy. I met him though he's a great guy mm -hmm. he's great so you know that sometimes kids grow up and they're not stars anymore yeah you know if this success was to stop tomorrow I, I really wouldn't be upset because what a great life I've had already exactly you know exactly I mean I, put it there you go <laughs> This gentleman right here. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, great show, Tom. Uh, Rick, um, being that you're 10 years old... Uh, I'm what is this, gum night here, for heaven's sake? Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Uh, but uh, being that you're um, 10 years old, do you have a separate schedule than everybody else? I mean, do you get separate wake-ups, or because of your tutoring or whatever you have, do you have a separate schedule than everybody else? Um, no, I usually get up around 8, 7.30, and um, then I have breakfast, and I, and I go and see what we're going to do, and I have school for three hours, and... No, they don't give me a separate schedule. I'm just as tough as any of them. That's <laughs> all right. We'll work this one gentleman in right here. Yes, sir. Ricky, fantastic actor, first of all, I want to say. And, Ricky, has this success that you've had right now and the commercial success had any effect on your personal friends that you've made growing up? Um, well, it, um, the, I'll tell you the story. The, I just moved to this new house in Connecticut, but uh, I, I'm still a Brooklyner. You know, I still live in New York. But we, um, we moved to Connecticut, and this girl really didn't like me, and these other two girls liked me, you know? So next day, when they find out I was in movies, this girl that didn't like me goes, Hi, Ricky. <laughs> <laughs> and the other two girls that like me still like me, so that's how I can tell my two friends. How about your boyfriend? Boyfriend? What do you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> no, you see... 
You see, he means like you maybe you played. All my buddies. Yeah, exactly. Oh, like buddies. like you know like like you play baseball with or play oh. ball with or shoot pool with that sort of thing. I am. Um, they I, don't think you're a swell, do they? No, they they treat me as a regular guy. All right. I am a regular. Guy. All right. Keep being a regular guy. Okay. And thanks for coming tonight. And Thank put you. Put her there. Sorry. All right. All right. Ricky Schroeder now appearing in uh, the Earthling. We'll be right back. <laughs> All right. Here is Iggy Pop with the song. Oh, is that it? Here is Iggy Pop with a song from his new album, which is called Soldier Iggy and the Band with Dog Food. Here they are. food composes my wife on D. That's right. He's not taking off his clothes tonight, girls. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to really give you the full introduction because you were playing there, but I read that you described your mu music as being savage. Is that what you think it is, or is that a misquote? Well, no, I was talking to your chick who worked for you the other day. Yeah. Is, it, is this mic working? Yep. Yeah, and uh, she asked me for a one-word definition. Yep. And one hates to define oneself, you know, so I, I just use what some guy in a newspaper said that. Okay. Yeah. Well, you got more than, I know you're Since out of breath. I've come up with painful, uh, <laughs> it's intrusive okay. music. Okay. But, 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 but only but, to but, squares. But, 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 but. Only intrusive to squares. May it's I fun. It's for fun. May I say, it's easily heard. I thought okay. so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but can I ask you something that I've always wanted to ask people who do what you do for a living? Because your music is <laughs> loud and yeah. it's driving. Do you hear yourself? Can you hear your own voice when you're singing back there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We have, mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, you paid for it, but we have these little monitors. Yeah? Uh, when, I'll tell you what. Yeah? Oh, really? <laughs> That's a good question. When, you, when, when that band is when driving. When you see the next song, you'll notice on the left and right of the stage, to the far sides, these little boxes on the floor. Got it. That's half of it, and then you've got great ones. These little things on stands, little tiny speakers pointing mm -hmm. toward either of the guitar guitar people. Players, persons. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. And, and that's how you hear each other. Okay. You know, it's, it's sort of a very, uh, it's, it's the musician's bane. It's the bane of your existence because when you start out, you can't hear... Nothing. You can't hear... Uh, Anything. 
You can't hear what I can't flush in my hotel all the time. Uh, I right? got, I, they got the signs in the hotels too, huh? Well, no, it's just that, you know, I live in a cheap place, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but how, how big an audience for this type of music, which has been called New Wave, do you think there is? And if you toned it down a little bit, maybe you'd have more fans. Do you think about that at all? Why are you bleeding? Uh, huh? Why are you bleeding? Oh, uh, because I'm on your show. Oh, okay. <laughs> No, I hit. I hit. Do my, you do that? I hit my nose. No, I'll tell you, I hit my nose in the mic stand because because uh, I was I was determined not to break one of your mics. Do you I, uh, this thing where you throw up on the audience and make yourself bleed and roll on glass? Water. Ah, oh, here we go. Sorry. Do you, do you do that? What did I ever? Yeah. Yes. Why? Well. See how quiet they are. They want to hear. The first time I ever did it was uh, it was out of frustration. Um, I just felt very bad at the time, and uh, and uh, um, music is a, an expressive medium that that sometimes uh, sometimes it can get out of hand, you know. And suddenly, maybe you'll be playing a tune, and you really want to express the truth. And the truth at that moment was that I ought to be cut, so I cut myself, mm -hmm. you know. You see, that scares some people. Well, that was a long time ago, okay. man. Okay, no. I know. What were you doing that year, you know? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what year did you do it? Uh, 73, I think. You were covering, you were just starting to cover really interesting news events for a L.A. show. Is That's that right? right? That's correct. About that year, you know, so, you know. Why people shouldn't are... people be frightened? By this music. Well, I didn't. You know, that's not, you know, like no, you said that's not nothing to do with the music. That's no. just something I did once. You okay, know? but there are some people who as I had problems. I I hope I hope to hell that somebody in the record business and the movie business, you know, who, who wants to watch someone with some real talent and something and say, well, forgive me for my problems formerly. You know, you know, out there. You know, if people don't forgive you for your problems, what the I mean, what you know. Just as some people were very terrified of rock and roll when it started, and then they got terrified of the Beatles, there are some people who get scared by okay. any new trend in music. Fair enough. I'll tell Why you one terror. Good right. question. Okay. In this music, one terror is that if you play music like the way I do, okay, obviously already, if I put as much into a song as I possibly can on mm -hmm. your show, mm -hmm. automatically for five, ten minutes, it's very hard for me to, to speak articulately or to, to talk to you. You see, because okay. you're pumped because up back I've, there, because sure. I've because I've uh, quite quite given myself totally to, to that. It's, it's Dionysic, if you know the difference between Dionysic and Apollonian art. I'm not too good on that. Uh, <laughs> Dionysic art in, in Greek times is where like a bunch of people would get together and they'd, uh, they'd, they'd erect a, a paper phallus 50 feet long and carry it around and chant to some god that they believed in, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and sort of, uh, how should I say, the creation of an event. It's eventful art. Mm -hmm. uh, Apollonian is when you just make a statue and it's there forever and it's set out very clearly. Okay. There's a Dionysic element to my art that, that does, I suppose a lot of people might be frightened to be me, but I'm quite happy to be, you know? All right. In the world of music, who are your favorites? Who are people you've looked up to as you've grown up and grown into the music business? Um, a lot of otherworldly types, like uh, Sun Ra is one. A uh, guy called Cab Calloway. Mm -hmm. You probably know him. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the guy? Fats Waller. Okay. Uh, Holland Wolf. People that you're talking about could be described in a one-word label again as being conventional. No, they weren't at the time. At no, the time, but, but everything at, evolves. You know, when you look back. Well, they got they, conventional yeah, this yeah. year, but but back then they 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 were sort of sleazy. You know, I mean, I hang out. You know, I mean, I'd rather have fun than anything else. You know. But you said something at the beginning of our talk. This music is supposed to be fun. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not a put down. It's not a threat. It's yeah, not, it's for fun. Okay, that's the that's the uh, that's what it's for. It's a function like. Will you introduce the gentleman in your band when you get back to do this next ah, number? I'd love to, oh, yeah. All right, terrific. All right you do for that. Me. And the song uh, that you're going to sing for us is called Five Foot One. Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Iggy Pop will be right back after these announcements from our sponsors and from the NBC television stations. And thank you for being with us tonight. Okay.
Here again are Iggy Pop and the band, and the song is called Five Foot One, but first some introductions, Iggy, if you please. Okay, yeah, hi America, uh, this is Iggy Pop talking, and that's Rob Dupre there, he plays a guitar. Right there. And this guy's Michael Page, he plays a bass guitar. This guy here is Dougie, Dougie Bomb, he plays the drums. And that's Ivan Kral, and he plays a guitar too. This is Iggy Pop. All right, let's go. Just be natural. Now you watch this, man. If you can still hear me, uh, Iggy Pop and company will return a little bit later on to do a number which is called TVI, and we appreciate their being here tonight. 
Uh, next up, we have Mr. Jerome Smith, who is the author of a book which is called The Coming Currency Collapse. Now, this sounds like a dire prediction, I know, but as the rate of inflation shoots higher and higher, that's exactly what Jerome Smith is forecasting, and apparently many people are listening to what he has to say. His book, The Coming Currency Collapse, and what you can do about it, is uh, on the top of the bestseller list right now all across the country. Please welcome Mr. Jerome Smith. Jerry? <laughs> For the uninitiated, an uninitiated, a currency collapse, what is that? What happens? Well, basically, it's, uh, it's got a lot of historical precedents. Uh, following uh, the French inflation in the 18th century, Napoleon came to power. Following the German Weimar inflation in the 1920s, mm -hmm. Hitler came to power. And that's most frequently the result. But a currency collapse occurs when the rate of inflation moves from double digits to triple digits and just keeps going. Mm -hmm. And that means that the currency becomes worth so little that people will not accept it in uh, trade. No longer a useful means of trade or barter, right. as it were. Right, now, let me ask you something. A currency collapse implies that, as you say, the money is worth nothing. Inflation going out of control, in my mind, is something different. Prices keep getting higher and higher. The spending power of each individual monetary unit becomes less and less, but it doesn't become something of no value at all. So are we talking about that sort of thing, or are you talking about something as has happened in European countries where it's really worthless paper? People just will not accept it. I'm, that I'm people in this country will not accept dollar bills, paper money, coin of the realm as lawful tender, legal tender. I'm talking about exactly that, Tom. But I think it's important to recognize that the damage from inflation occurs during the process of inflation, and in the case of the United States dollar and the other post-World War II currencies, it has occurred over a period of decades. And the final collapse is not where the damage is done. That's where a new beginning can occur. And that's why it's so important for people to understand today what's going on and to anticipate the ultimate consequence so that each of us in understanding this and anticipating it can act accordingly and prepare ourselves for that so that when the crisis comes it also is an opportunity that can be taken advantage of because there are three distinct possible consequences that will right. come along with this collapse and uh, only one of them is pessimistic and that's the historical precedence I mentioned of the Napoleon and the Hitler. But there's two other possibilities. The first and most likely possibility is that the officials will wake up as they are beginning to do. Uh, a lot of the things that Mr. Reagan is saying are very positive, and I wish him a lot of success. But the point is that they'll come I, to a I, point I, I get from the where they say, say that. hey, this won't work. <laughs> no, We've got to make a change. Jerome, I get from what you're saying about Ronald Reagan, you're saying, He's making, trying to take a positive approach, and I wish him a lot of luck. As if you're saying, he's trying, but what he's doing ain't going to work. Can I come back to that? I'd like to give these three okay. real quick. Okay, all right, fine. Let me write that down, though. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, take notes. Yeah, okay. I will. okay, okay, all right, fine. First possibility is there will be uh, some sort of an international meeting of central bankers and uh, treasurers, uh, national treasurers, on a global basis involving all the Western nations. Uh, and they'll sit down and say, hey, look, We've got to do something different. We've got to return to what we know works. And the only thing they know that works is the gold standard. And of course, they'd have to have a gold price uh, much above the um, free market price at the time and to return to redeemable currencies and fixed exchange rates. That's one possibility. All right. And in my opinion, it's not the most hopeful one. And I'll come back to why not in a minute. The second possibility is that in the process of approaching this collapse, private alternative means of exchange will emerge and evolve to the point where they'll sim simply be embraced. And uh, there's precedent for this as well. And when you say primary means of exchange, is uh, it as primary as, I want that cup, would you like this box, we'll make a trade? Is it now, that'd be barter. Right. And I'm talking about indirect exchange, wherein some item of exchange becomes the favorite medium for indirect exchange. And this is exactly how gold and silver got established in the markets as money to begin with. It wasn't through any official pronouncement. It was through the uh, free actions of exchanging individuals and gold and silver simply emerged as the favorite item to accept. Wouldn't it have been great if they exchange. would have picked uh, ferns or hay? Well, they're perishable. Yeah, or wood. Right. To get to that third one, 
Oh, and that's the Napoleon Hitler okay. syndrome. Yeah. And I don't really think the climate is ripe for that in the United States. We have too great a tradition of individual freedom and non-reliance on government. In spite of the excesses of the past few decades and too much reliance on government, we still retain that tradition. So I'm hopeful that we will not have a Napoleon or a Hitler come in in the midst of the crisis and in the midst of the cries, we need leadership, help us. This is the circumstances under which that could happen. Right, can I come back now to the Ronald Reagan situation and sure. uh, the speech which he made to the nation here about a week and a half, two weeks ago, in which he talked about the emergency that we now face financially. He came just short of calling it uh, economic disaster yeah. and his efforts to dampen inflation, cut spending, et cetera, et cetera. How successful is that method of approach in your view? His method is right on, and I listened carefully to his talk, and I have to say it is one of the best talks given to the American public by any president within my memory. Uh, I, I have to say that it's too little. He is taking steps in the right direction, and he's limited by what is possible in the Congress. He is limited and the Congress in turn is limited by what is possible with the voting public. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not entirely faulting him in well, saying that it was too limited. He needs not minor surgery. We don't need a tonsillectomy. We need massive surgery on right. the federal government. Rather than talking about what he should do, since that's up to him, right. we ought to talk about what we should do, because that we have some control over. But first I have to do some commercials. We will continue right after these announcements. Mr. Smith's book is called The Coming Currency Collapse and What You, We, Can Do About It. What can we do about it? Well, basically, Tom, recognize that paper money has always been a money substitute. When we had redeemable currency, that was understood by the mm -hmm. public generally. This paper represented the money that was on deposit with the United States Treasury, and at that time, the, the notes read, this certifies that there has been deposited with the United States Treasury $20 in gold coin payable mm -hmm. to bear on demand or $1 in silver coin payable to bear on demand. At that time, everyone understood that the money was the gold or silver. Mm -hmm. We need to protect ourselves now. We need to return to that understanding. And as individuals, take all of your dollar-denominated investments, your savings accounts, your bonds, your uh, life insurance, uh, cash it in, and take those dollars and use them to purchase those money substitutes and use them to purchase the real money, which is the gold and silver coins. Mm -hmm. And depending on the size of one's portfolio, you could choose the silver coins or the ones minted uh, prior to 1965 or the gold coins. The idea being that when the currency collapse comes and nobody is accepting the paper, the coins will still be of value to buy things such as food. That is correct. And it's also true that as the paper goes down, the metal goes up. Twas ever thus. Ever those. Thank exactly you very much, right. Mr. Smith, for being with us tonight. Been a pleasure, Mr. Jerome Smith. The coming currency collapse and what you can do about it. We will be right back after this for the NBC Television Station. Everybody at one time has problems with a lover, but Dorothy Green Pepper is an original. She makes a career out of lovers' quarrels and sexual fiascos, and she has a great time in the process, and so do we. Would you please welcome the author of Hate Poems for Ex Lovers, my friend. Miss Dorothy Green Pepper. Dorothy. Your outfit is enough. It really is enough. I can't believe that you have a heart on. Oh, oh my gosh. I didn't know. I talk to me like that. I'm a southern lady. I'm going to get one of those pornograms from my little old brother in Richmond, Virginia, if you keep on talking to me like that. My goodness. I thought you were going to talk about my red feather boa, the best boa I ever had. I was I talking about had. your red hat and your Valentine's getup is what I was talking about. <laughs> and anybody who thinks anything other doesn't understand what I'm talking about. Oh, you about. mean it's a hard hat, right? That's exactly right. correct. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I'm wearing my hard hat tonight. Exactly. All right. I'll keep, I'll keep up with you any old day, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> start. They're waiting for me. I know exactly start, how to make my... Start running, okay? Oh, okay. <laughs> 
go make my second million dollars on you. I'm making my first on my broken heart from this book, Hate Poems for Ex-Lovers, uh -huh. right? Yeah. I haven't made it yet, but I'm making it. Uh -uh. Okay. <laughs> but the second one I'm going to make on you because when I was in Richmond, Virginia, over Christmas holidays, I walked into this snazzy dress shop, you know, where they have to look you up and down in Bradstreet before they say, how do? Yeah. <laughs> like that, you know. And all the clothes in there look like they came out of a museum. You know, they have to be at those prices. So uh, I, w I walked in and I put on these heart-shaped glasses and they remembered seeing me on this one. They said, oh my God, I saw you, I saw you, I saw you, I, I saw, saw you, you with Tom. Did they say anything else? They said, <laughs> Tom, they said, what's he like? <laughs> oh, I, I said, he said, it, it did you touch my I had to do it just then because I have to satisfy him. That's how I'm going to make that second million dollars. And <laughs> they said, what's he like? <laughs> And is he really any good? And you know, all that kind of thing. And Tell the I, truth now. Am I any good? That's how I was going to make the second million dollars. You're okay. going to pay me not to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> you fit for that. <laughs> Won't work. Anyway, Won't you, work. Were, you were right about the dresses. But in but Richmond, go Virginia, ahead, yeah. I won't tell you something. I don't know how you're cutting it up north, but in Richmond, Virginia, you could really get sliced up like corn pone because they just love you there. <laughs> no. They think you're so sexy. And I said, I really. You know, I can't look at that cleft in your chin. I wish you'd turn your head over that way so I can go on and do my business and talk to these people out here because you just drive me crazy. I, ca I can't stand it. <laughs> you know, I wrote you a letter. Hold it, hold it. It ain't a drive. It's a short walk. Okay. <laughs> you mean I'm already there. Now All let right, me well, ask never you mind. something. Hold, hold. Never mind. You just said you're nasty for the evening. Now you quit. Your time is up. You can't say another mean thing. <laughs> Can I just ask one little eensy, eensy, Go ahead. Teensy, Go eensy, ahead. I'll let tiny, you. Go tiny ahead. Question. Why do so many if people... If it's that small, why ask it? <laughs> how about... How about... How about asking Go ahead. this one, okay? <laughs> Go ahead. Now listen to me very carefully. <laughs> I can't talk. I'm laughing so hard. Oh my God. Now, how come so many people who call themselves lovers are fighting all the time? You give seminars. I mean, you go to people, you go to weekend singles groups, and you, you talk to people who are there because they are having problems with the people that they claim to like or love, and they're fighting all the time. Well, they can decide whether they're P-O-L or P-O-W, prisoners of love or prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, one is fighting, saying, let's fight this thing out, and the other is saying, let's fight it in. So that's their problem. Now... Uh, <laughs> I, I'm just I, too subtle for you I, sometimes. I, I, I'm just too subtle for you. I don't know what to do with I you. I surrender. Go, on. <laughs> go ahead. Well, I'll tell you what the truth is. I, all those singles weeks that I do, I'm going to go right back to the hotel now. This is the biggest singles week of all. Oh, darn Valentine's Day, you know. And they all come in there, and they want me to put a man or woman in the hands because that's what I read. You know, I read hands, and they want a man or woman in the hands. I read life in your hands, and I think life is the only thing worth fighting about, frankly. Not people. Mm -hmm. Not males and females. Did Heck, you, I never believe in fighting about those. Just go on and enjoy them. That's did, it. Did you um, address a convention of morticians once? Oh, yes, I did. My God, you have been reading that background material. <laughs> this is just... Awful. Well, is that a lively crowd? And I don't mean to pun there at all, but I mean, when you go to a convention of morticians, I mean, how do you... They like to play dead. Look <laughs> 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 hey, at all my cards. All right. All right. Now, these are the things that that <laughs> awful... <laughs> oh. Go ahead. Read that all one. Right. I dare you. Go ahead. Here's Here a valentine. Go ahead. Read that one. <laughs> I'm, I don't... Listen, I hate to read this one. Go ahead. I hate to... I, hate to I, I must have written it with my eyes shut, you know, like this, because I'm so ashamed every time I see something <laughs> like this. Dear, dear Gorilla Girl, no matter what they call you, you are the best organ grinder I ever met. <laughs> 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 They're screaming for more. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> I've had a lot of lovers in my life. I haven't had all the lovers in hate poems for ex-lovers, because if I had, I'd be lying down dead somewhere. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Mm -hmm. And they were lousy ex-lovers. And uh, most of my ex-lovers were, well, for a while, I collected 
ROBs, and I was listening to that man, you know, about all this crisis about what's going to happen to the dollar. I've and got ten seconds to get this over with. Here's the, the poem here. You want the poem? Uh, and that's all the time we've that's got? That's it. You can't hear about my rich old no, bankers. Next, oh, no, my God, next you're time you it. come, you can read my poem. Dear Cupid, God of Eris, please give me a one-night stand that I can stand in the morning. <laughs> Dorothy Green Pepper will return. Thanks for being here tonight. And Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> we'll be right back after these announcements. <laughs> Have a good weekend now. Thank you all for watching our show, and we'll see you on Monday night. My thanks to Iggy Pop, who's been with us tonight and is back with us again to say good night, everybody. Good night, all.